Easter is never found in the original Bible. It was a pagan feast to the apostate Chaldean goddess, the Queen of Heaven. <laughs> Terrible. But that's what it is. Well, where did it come from? Well, we won't turn it up, but in Genesis chapter 10, if you want to jot it down, verses 8 to 10, it talks about a man by the name of Nimrod, about grandson of Noah, and he built the city of Babylon and Nineveh and such like, and he began a new type of worship. And he, he claimed he was God. Can anybody tell me from the PowerPoint what he might have been claiming his name was? There it is, Nimrod, called Baal. Okay? Anyhow, he said, if I die in battle, I'll come back and I'll have intercourse with my wife and she will have a child. My wife is called Semiramis, the queen of heaven. And as time went by, she became called Ishtar. Ashtati said that earlier one. The vines, I think it was, commentary. Or Ishtar. Ah, you can see where Easter comes from. Easter. And he said he will have intercourse with her at the time of Easter. And the child will be born later on. Well, when was the child born? Here we are. Ishtar was supposed to conceive at the feast of Ishtar. Easter. Eggs, rabbits, symbols of fertility. And if you go nine months later on, the time a child takes to be born, we come to what feast? Any of the young ones? Go on. Yep. Sorry? Christmas. Christmas, yeah. There it is. Christmas. And that was, well, the day after, if you live in the northern hemisphere, when the sun god, Baal god, got to the lowest height and the next day it's born. It goes up, doesn't it? Each day gets higher and higher after December the 25th. So it's worshipping the sun god. So isn't that intriguing? And that's come down through history. Wow, Babylonians held that idea. There's the first god, the father god, the sun god and the queen god or the mother god. And that's come down through all of those nations. It's come down through the Babylonians, through apostate Israel, Egypt, Greece, India, Rome, and so forth, right down to Catholicism. Catholicism. There it is. It came right down to that time. And Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor, talk a bit more about him in a minute, he brought that into, into vogue in 325 AD. He had a conference called the Nicene Conference. And what he tried to do was to bring together Christianity with paganism, unite his empire religiously. And he did so in this Nicene Creed. And so he introduced a new idea. Well, we won't go there quite. He introduced a new idea, the three gods. No, it wasn't. It was held by these nations. But it was new to Christianity. And he endeavoured to fuse together Christianity with paganism in the year 300 onwards, AD. And he did so predominantly in a big conference that he held, the Nicene Conference, in 325 AD. There it is. So this was what he wanted to achieve. He wanted to achieve that unity, and that's what did it. Well, let's come on from there. What about Jesus? According to that idea, of course, initially, Jesus, the Son, was a God. Is that what the Bible says? Can anybody tell me an idea that disproves that in one word almost? Have a look at this quote. Tell me how that disproves it. Where's Jesus now? Someone? Where's Jesus now? Seated at God's right hand. God's right hand. So he's not God. And you know, that's repeatedly stated within the word of God. 
repeatedly stated. Twelve times in the Bible that's stated. Think of it. Twelve times in the Bible it's stated that Jesus is now, having risen from the dead, seated at God's right hand so he's not God. Clear as day, isn't it? Clear as day. So now, when we come to the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to have these subject, this subject of what Jesus is clear in our mind. He can die. If he was God, he could not die. If he was part of the Trinity, he could not die. If Easter was true as the Christians believed, he could not die. And it's vital, utterly vital. Now you come with me to John chapter 4. Here's a quote worth looking at. There it is on the PowerPoint, I know. But we'll have a look at it. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells us something very, very important. Early in the piece, in his ministry. In John chapter 4 and verse 23, he said this. But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshippers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Pretty strong words, aren't they? So what he is saying to us is that we must worship him in truth we must have a true understanding of what jesus is what god is the key subjects of the scriptures we must have that right it's utterly essential if we want salvation come over a few pages oh sorry same page. chapter john, come back a page john chapter 3 verse 14 and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Oh yes, we might die. But the scripture is saying if we held the truth and did what Jesus said, we will not die. We will not perish. We will be saved, resurrected in the future, and God willing, given life eternal. So here we are in two key quotes from the early ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's essential to believe the truth. It's essential to have this subject well understood so we don't have Easter and things like that. Trinity, but we have the truth as taught in the Bible. Well, what did Jesus say about his sacrifice? Well, in Luke chapter 24, verse 6, he said this. He is not here, but he is risen. Well, they, they said this about him, about Jesus. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and, rise, and the third day rise again. Now, let me ask you, what does the church say this death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished? They say he died instead of us. Here's the same people who have Ishtar, Easter, the Trinity, and they're saying he died instead of us. If Christ died instead of us, then why do we all die? It's the one certain thing about all mankind except for the Lord Jesus Christ. They've all died. And secondly, if he died instead of us, instead of us, you imagine, we're a criminal. We've sinned. We're hanging up. We're going to be hung. And Jesus races up to us and says, I'm going to die instead of you. Then what should happen to us? Well, why? Uh, why do we all still die? And why did he rise from the dead? See? If he died instead of us, he shouldn't have risen. Should he? And lastly, why must he rise from the dead for us to be saved? 
So you see, the church concept, as I say to you about Easter, Trinity, and so forth, and the subject of the Lord Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, they don't have a clear. They don't rightly understand it. So we need to understand this subject properly. Now, what we really want to do is look at God's aim with this earth. Now, here's a quote. It's going to be hard for the young ones to turn up. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. See who can get there first. I'll have a keep a guy out. Ooh, I think I can see one already. You got it? Okay, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we have the purpose God has with this earth. And that's what we want to look at, first of all. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Why did he do that? Well, he had a purpose in mind. Now, look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Here he is, is talking to the angels. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So what God did is he made this earth and he put mankind upon it and he had a purpose in mind. And that purpose in mind is that man might fill this earth with individuals who praise God who honour God, who give glory to God. And that's what he went on to say. Here's my aim. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. There's God's aim. No shadow of doubt about it. And you know, that's repeatedly stated in Scripture. Psalm 72 verse 9. Isaiah 11 verse 9. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. Revelation 21 verses 4 and 5, etc., etc. Repeatedly. From one end of scripture to the other, that's God's aim. To fill this earth with individuals who reflect his qualities, his, his way of behaviour, which we can see in the Lord Jesus Christ, his son. Follow his example. Then indeed we'll have a place in this earth in the near future. That's what he is saying for us there. But of course, we're in Genesis in Genesis chapter 2, God put a test before man. Look at chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Well, think about it. You can have everything but one. I'm putting one little test before you. You can eat what you like. But one tree only. Well, we know what took place. They failed, didn't they? They failed on that one test. And we see that in Genesis 3, verse 6, a few verses on. There we read, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, remember it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it unto her husband with her and he did eat. Oh, what a tragedy. Only one tree they're not to eat and they did. They did. So they failed. So what then was the consequence of sin? What was the consequence of sin? It had two consequences. The first of all was a Physical consequence. Now you come with me to chapter 3, verse 19. Just for a moment. First of all, And in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. Oh. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. You'll die. That's what he said. And it's not going to be easy. There's going to be weeds in the garden and difficulties. It's not going to be easy because you failed to do what I said. But come back with me to chapter 2, verse 17 for a minute. There's a change there. I'll read the whole verse. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
Well, that wasn't true. It, can anybody tell me how long Moses, uh, Adam lived? He lived to 930 years. Chapter 5, verse 5. We won't turn it up, but if you wanted to, he lived to quite a long time. So, hey, in the day you eat thereof, did he die? He didn't. Well, have a look at the margin. If you've got an Oxford margin, it gives you a rewording of it, but I've got it up here. Dying thou shalt die. A process will begin. A process will begin. A physical process will begin and you'll finally die. Yeah, it's one thing you can be absolutely certain about. In life, it'll come to an end. All of us will die unless Christ returns before that time. We know that. So here, certainly what was said at that time would take place. Well, it really mean to, seemed to take a long time, didn't it? But it would take place. Now, come with me into the New Testament for a minute. And we can um, look at Romans chapter 5. What happened way back then is repeated right through to the New Testament. It's as sure as eggs that this will happen. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Wherefore... As by one man sin entered into the world. Huh, that was Adam, wasn't it? There it is. We could write Genesis chapter 3 verse 12 or whatever it was that we looked at before. There it is. Adam sinned. And then we note there what he goes on to say. And death by sin. So death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. So it doesn't matter what you do about physical exercise, eating good, clothes, good food, going to the right doctor, having right medicine. It might extend your life, but it's still come to a conclusion. We'll all die. You will die, thou shalt die. And a process begins at birth. The process, decay, dying. Okay, it might take, like it did in Moses, Adam's time, 930 years, but he died. And today, three score years and ten is the norm. Some of us have passed that, thank goodness. But there we are, 70 years. So that's what the scripture tells us is going to happen. And we could read that further if you have a look with me to Romans chapter 3. We're in Romans 5. Come over to Romans 3. And have a look at Romans 3 verse 23. For all have sinned. Huh. So what happened to Adam? We've all followed in that way. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God and being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the only hope is through Jesus Christ. So all have sinned, all will die. So you see, a physical change took place. A physical change took place. And there was a real change in man at that time. But there was another change that took place. The other change was that man began to have an inclination and propensity to sin. Now, inclination means bend over towards. When there's two things to do, more often than not, men bend towards sin. Inclination or a propensity towards sin. And... Where they haven't got the constraint of the Bible, very often people are very inclined to doing that which is wrong. Well, look, here's the proof of it. So a mental change would take place at that time for Adam, Eve, and all their descendants. Ecclesiastes says this, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but... They have sought out many inventions, many schemes, many inclinations and propensities towards sin. So now man has a mental change too that has taken place. You know, we could repeat that many times in scripture. Oh, here's a few quotes. We won't turn it up. But in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 it says, And God, we Yahweh, saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually oh Jeremiah says the heart 
is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful and desperately wicked. I could add to that eight other quotes there, some of them. Credible, isn't it? The Bible repeatedly states that. And we know that's true. We know that's true. That's the way people act, isn't it? Well, there we can see it. But you see now, there's a problem. How are we going to get out of it? God has a solution. God has a solution. God has condemned them to death, but at the same time showed them that there would be a way of hope which could finally lead to life eternal for the faithful. Are we there, them? Genesis says this, unto Adam and also unto his wife, did the Lord God make unto them coats of skins and clothe them, so to speak, to cover them? It didn't teach exactly that, but it hinted at the fact that they would be covered. They wouldn't face the temptation with each other, so to speak. But more particularly, maybe we can look at it. I don't know if we've gone, we can come back to Genesis. But in Genesis chapter 3, at the end of that chapter, he says, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Ah, now who are these cherubims? It speaks of angels particularly. These are individuals who are working invisibly to help us. Anybody who strives to do that to find the way to life eternal. Find the way to the tree of life. And so their aim, and if you haven't gotten down, you can write it here. See that word there, keep? That word there keeps means to preserve, to guard. So God is guarding that way and keeping it available for us in his mercy and his love. What a wonderful hope we have. That God is working, if only we'll accept that way. Well, what's the solution? Well, the solution, you're in Genesis. And here's where the young one's got a bit of a big job to do. Is to fill out these details. Look with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Here was the way. Right at the beginning, God gave an answer as to how it could be achieved. And he said there... Verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. A bit confusing. What does it mean? Well, this is what it means. Here's those words. I hope that's readable. It's one size smaller because I wanted to put quite a bit on the screen. Yes, I think it's readable, hopefully. But it's there before you in your Bible. So what we want to do is look at what's going on in that chapter. We're going to pick it up, as I read before, from there. And I will put enmity between thee and between thee and the woman. Well, what's that? First of all, well, here it is. I, God, will put enmity, enmity's hatred, or even fear, see, there we are, between Eve and mankind and the serpent. So here we can see it. <laughs> Here's the depiction. Eve and the serpent. There would be a fear between the two. If you had a snake running along there, I think we'd move over this way and that way, wouldn't we? There's the fear. <laughs> okay. So that indeed would be what we would be doing. But further to that... The next step is the next statement he said. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. That is between thee, the serpent, and the woman, which was Eve, and therefore all mankind to some degree. But further than that, he then went on to say, and between thy seed and her seed. Between thy seed and her seed. Who's thy seed? The seed of the serpent. Individuals who go the ways of the flesh. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees. And her seed? Well, Jesus Christ. Now, 
Come with me just to see that point. Keep your hand here. But if you like, come with me to, um, first of all, the seed. Is that the one I want? Just a minute. Yeah. Come with me, first of all, to, uh, say, Matthew chapter 12. First book of the New Testament. Not hard to turn up. Matthew 12, halfway through the book. And if we read there, and it's stated in all of those three quotes, so it's not uncommon. This is something Jesus said, verse 37. Um, have I got that right? Sorry, verse 34. And he's speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Oh, generation of vipers. What's a viper? Excellent. Top of the class. A snake. That's right. <clears throat> I will put a generation, oh, generation of snakes, we could say. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Well, we saw that before, didn't we? So here are people following in the ways of flesh. So there's the Pharisees and Sadducees community there. Okay? Thy seed. And her seed? Well, come back with me to, or come with me to Matthew chapter 1. And verse, sorry, uh, Luke chapter 1, my apologies, that'll do. Matthew 1 would have done, but Luke chapter 1 and verse 31. Matthew, Mark, Luke, well here we are, Luke chapter 1. And here it talks about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does it tell us about him? Well in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 1, when I get there in a second... And verse 31, it speaks of his birth. Verse 31, And behold thou, speaking to Mary, shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So you can see what he is saying to us very clearly. And then in verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, that is unto Mary, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, that's God's power, shall overshadow thee. And therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here's the way in which salvation was going to come through the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So what's going to be the consequence? Well, here it is. Here it is. It shall bruise thy head. So the serpent's effect will be that all men will die. We talked about that before. So we don't need to enlarge on that. But he then goes on to say, and thou shalt bruise his head, uh, his heel. The bruise on the head is permanent. If you gave me a whack, I'd die or get concussed and then probably die. But a bruise on the heel uh, might be sore for a long time, but it usually will heal. So it's not permanent. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died and would rise again. So here's a picture of the tomb. And remember, when the women came to the tomb the day after he rose, or the day he rose, they looked in and there was the angels. And they said, he is risen. He is risen. And so here we can see that temporary wound that took place. Now, I hope I haven't gone too fast for the young ones who are filling in all the details. But there we are. There we are. There's what happened at that time. An amazing event. Or not happened at that time, but was prophesied at that time. Now, well, it required, therefore, that there be a sinless man who died. Hebrews says that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil, or the flesh. Now, we want to know how that was achieved. How was that achieved? He had to be made the same as us. Wherefore, 
in all things that behove of him to be made like unto his brethren. What did that mean? Well, he had an inclination, a propensity to sin. He could sin. He was flesh and blood. He was a man. He could sin just like us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So somehow, because he was a man, he could save us. How could he do that? Well, of course, he suffered trials, but he didn't succumb. He suffered trials, but he didn't fail. He consistently did that which is right. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. He was sinless. So what was necessary was a sinless man. A sinless person. You know, if you look at Hebrews chapter 4, sorry, no, it's, yeah, it's on the path. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9 speaks of, of the fact that he loved righteousness. You may not, if you've got time to turn up, you can have a quick look with me. But I want you to look up with me, the rest of you, the young ones particularly. Turn up with me, Isaiah 40, 50. Isaiah 50. But I'll read out to you Hebrews 1 and verse 9. Thou... Has loved righteousness, that's Jesus, and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, have anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. So he was going to be helped and he was to succeed. But now have a look with me to Isaiah chapter 50. I hope it's 50. Let me have a look. But in Isaiah 50, it talks about what happened to Jesus when he was very, very young. He got a lot of help. Remember when he was born, God said, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will work upon your womb, Mary, and you'll bring forth a child. But look at Isaiah 50 and verse 4. Now, I'll read it. You think about it. The Lord God hath given me, and he's talking about Jesus, the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth, he wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. So what did that mean? Well, Jesus was in bed morning by morning. And an angel probably was taken, sent, touched him, woke him and educated him. He received wisdom from God. Where can we get wisdom from God? From this book. But nothing like what he had. He was helped by God. He was encouraged by God. But God didn't stop him from sinning. He could have sinned, but he didn't. He didn't. And the consequence, though, again, if you come back with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 5, verse 12, Maybe we won't turn it. It made him of a quick understanding in God's word. Hebrews 4 verse 12. But still, God's law of sin and death required that he died. Remember, all men are going to die. But he was righteous. He never failed. Now, you see, things are going to be changed. Whom God have raised up and loosed the loins of death because it was, hey, listen, not possible for him to be holden of it. Why was he raised? Why wasn't it possible? Because God is a righteous God. He is a wonderful God. He is a caring God, but he is utterly righteous and always does that which is right. Jesus hadn't sinned. He shouldn't die. But you see, he had that law working in him that he would die, and he did. But you see, how long did he remain in the grave? Anybody like to tell me? <laughs> three days and three nights. Why not anymore? Why did he remain there only that period? 
because it shouldn't see corruption. And body will corrupt after that time. And so God, doing that which is always righteous and true, raised him. He raised him from the dead. You see, here's the benefits. Hebrews 5 says this, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. God helped him. God cared for him. And so he had that flesh like us, but he did not sin. Romans says this, So also is the free gift, the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So Jesus was raised from the dead. But there is a blessing coming on other people. We're going to see how in a minute. For it was by one man's offence death reigned, that's Adam, much more the gift of righteousness reigneth in the life of one Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead. And what else did he do thereby? Well, he would save us. He, uh, first the Corinthians 15 says that. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. Well, of course he did. He did rise. But now in Christ, risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. There's going to be others. For since by man came death, by God man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ Jesus shall all be made alive. So what's going to happen? How is it going to work? Those who are one with Christ, having accepted the way of Christ, followed in his example, the endeavour to walk in that right way, God says, I will raise them too. I have opened the door. I've removed that law for the faithful. So you see, maybe we can remember something we looked at this morning. But in John chapter 3, we won't turn it up, I just popped it in as, as a consequence of our very good exhortation that we looked at this morning. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So where? There. In the wilderness, Moses put a stake up and a serpent on it. And he said, now you look at that. Look at that principle. Now we're going to look at that in a minute. The result, if you do so, you'll have life. You'll have life. Now we need to do that. We need to do that all the time. And we're reminded of that every Sunday morning. We don't have Easter, we don't have Passover, but we have Sunday mornings when we remember the serpent that died on the stake, typical of the Lord Jesus Christ who died on a stake. And we've got to remember that as 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us. So what should we do? Well, as we think about Christ, we should look at it. Crucify the flesh with its afflictions and lusts thereof. The inclination to sin. We should try with all our strength to reject it and go the other way. Toward God's things. Believe also. Have, oops, sorry. Believe also. Have faith in his name. What is his name? Yahweh shall save. Have faith in the name which God has promised through the Lord Jesus Christ, that there will be a way of hope for those in Christ who will be raised. That's what we need to be doing. That's what's needed, brethren and sisters and young people. But it's not going to save all. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13 says, Wherefore remember that being in times past, Gentiles in the flesh, and that at time you were without Christ, ah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, 
Ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So we've got to be associated with Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. We've got to remember that. We've got to associate with it and then remember it week by week. But how can we become associated with that sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we need to change. Salvation needs a change. We need to be baptised. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. God will view us in a different way. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and he is according to the promise. Think of that. What a wonderful blessing that gives to us. We are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Jesus Christ received, we can in a way receive if we're faithful. The door was open. Christ is, God has lifted the command that all die and now made it possible that those in Christ will rise. Again, Romans 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Therefore he buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's what we're, every morning, Sunday, every morning, Sunday morning, we're trying to remember to do that, reminder to do that as we think of the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Planted in the likeness of his death through baptism, then we have the hope of life eternal for all of us. Okay? We'll skip that one. Time's running away from us. Well, our hope is wonderful. You see, the Bible ends in Revelation chapter 22. Come back to chapter, or chapter 21. And God shall wipe away all tears from your eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor sorrowing. What a wonderful prospect. There's the kingdom coming. We want to be a part of it now. It's going to be a wonderful time. You think about it. The world today is a terrible place. But it'll be ruled by one just king, Jesus. A benevolent world government, caring government, ruled over by Jesus and the believers true justice and so on. It will be wonderful in that kingdom, but how can we be part of it? Here's the Lord's final closing words, really. He ascended to heaven, but just before that he said unto them, there are three things you must do. Three essential steps. And one of those essential steps, Believe the gospel. He said unto them, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth. That means we have faith, we have confidence, we have trust in the belief of the Bible and the key doctrines of that Bible. Believe the gospel, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And then be baptised. Become one with Christ. We saw that before through baptism. And then lastly, Continue faithfully. Continue faithfully in that way. Yes, Sunday by Sunday remembering him. Walking every day, putting aside the ways of the flesh and trying to walk the ways of the spirit. Put away the flesh and dedicate ourselves wholeheartedly to the things of God. Well, if we do that, finally, we'll be part there. God's aim will be achieved with this earth. Remember Genesis 1? Verse 21, verse 26. God's aim was to fill this earth with his glory. God willing, we'll do that. We'll do that. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And a wonderful accomplishment will be there. Now the burning question, of course, for each and every one of us is, will we be there? Well, let's concentrate on God's word putting those thoughts to our minds and developing our ways, following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and then believing that gospel, being baptised and then finally, if we continue faithfully until he comes, 
Our hope is sure and certain. The door has been opened by the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you.